Today I spoke with Kevin and Kevin and I met at the Vinnie Shawman hypnosis practitioner course where both of us thankfully passed and we discussed some of that about Kevin's school he teaches grappling and fighting styles and mindset we're both big advocates of mindset a genuinely nice guy and I thoroughly enjoyed talking to him and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did Good morning again. Welcome to the podcast. Nice to see you. Good morning. Good morning again. <laughs> yeah. So just, just quickly before we, we get into it, um, before you come on the podcast, you said you'd gone to walk your dog. What, what dog have you got? Uh, she's not actually mine. So over weekends, normally we're like top dog sisters for like the extended family. So one weekend we'll have uh, Sophie's mum and dad's dog. And then the weekend after normally we'll have a brother's dog. But her brother's dog's basically, like, it's, it's like joint custody, really. Because like, at the time, <laughs> we, haven't got, we, haven't, we haven't got time to have a dog. But, yeah. like, I'll always try to get one over weekend. Like, I love it. Uh, they're both Labradors. One's like a smaller, like, probably like a more like a working style one. Just like more like the yeah. American little one. And then the other one, the big one, Monty, he's, a, he's like a big classic British one you know, with the big head. Yeah, yeah. When I, when I was growing up, we had a, uh, a Labrador that was, um, my dad was into shooting and all of that, was actually... A proper uh, like Labrador gun dog type thing that was they're slightly smaller, slightly sleeker, mm. and uh, like more pointy faced. Them, yeah, them style. Yeah, but be beautiful dogs, absolutely beautiful. Oh, they're gorgeous. I love them. Yeah. I just yeah. wish I had more time to have the dog. My cards. Yeah. Well, we you we all know what my dog's about. So, yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah. And the funny thing, so just for give people reference, Kevin and I met a few weeks ago on a. Vinnie Shawman hypnosis practitioner course. And during that course, we all take it in turns to get up and down and be hypnotized by Vinnie and each other. It's, it's, and actually, just before we started recording, we're talking about how intensive that weekend could actually be. But there was a point during that course where Vinnie did a demonstration and with a, a pen, a red pen. And it was two, it was an auditory. Things that's correct, was no, no visual, it was a visualization, yeah. wasn't it? And anyway, my my kind of go to place was my dog Molly, and after that, it then became the Molly technique, been known as the in the, the WhatsApp group as the Molly technique. And when we came back, I filmed as I got out of my car, my dog getting ready to greet me, and so everyone could meet Molly. And yeah, it is it's interesting because I still that is still in my head every morning when I wake up. Excellent. I still, Excellent. it's weird. Whenever I, every morning when I wake up, I still, so to give people an idea of what this was about, it was about setting a cue for how you wake up in the morning. And because Molly sleeps on my bed, my cue was Molly. And it actually kind of weirdly works. Every morning I wake up. And the first thing I do is check for Molly. And then there's, and I, I what happens is I remember that moment when I was in the centre of the room with Vinny. And there's this, and I was just like, oh, it's, it's Molly, all right, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's just so conscious. I don't, I don't know how, that's the funny thing about the hypnosis weekend. There's so many things that go on and you don't quite know how to articulate them. Have you noticed since you've been doing sort of that Molly technique, your days are starting better or it has it had an effect on it? It's definitely had a positive effect because every time, every morning when I wake up, what I actually kind of remember is to do it, is to actually greet Molly. And I feel that instant appreciation for having her there. And it reminds me of being in the room. It's like the two are connected. <coughs> um, so it, it definitely has, it has definitely had a positive effect. But like I said, it's the difficulty of articulating it because you're just like, how, how do I explain to people that there's, it's actually almost a memory of being in the room with everyone else uh, sitting yeah. in the chair. And it's, but it, it, it does, it has set that morning up every morning. Oh, amazing. Good. You know, so, Good. and since you and I last actually saw each other, you've got your black belt now. Yeah. 
uh, got it on Tuesday night um, after 12 years of training. 12 hard years of, of graft. Literally blood, sweat and tears. So tell everyone about your jiu-jitsu school, club, business. Okay. It's everything, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's literally, yeah. It's like a, it's everything and everything. <laughs> um, so we opened up, it's called ASW Liverpool. We're based in, but we're actually based in Scalmersdale, which is outside of the city. Because um, originally we were, our premises that we were going to get was in like sort of like the city boundaries of Liverpool. But then, but then when we were about to sign for the landlord basically went, oh, I'll probably be closing the building down in a year. So it was like, so are you there with the pairs? Like, yeah, okay, we'll leave that. But we've already like made the company name and um, had all like the sort of our artwork done. So, but then the opportunity to to go in a unit in Skem, like a smaller place, just to start a little bit smaller and sublet in uh, a PT's unit at the time. But then we were open for maybe two, three months, and then literally the world collapsed, didn't it? In yeah. twenty twenty, <laughs> and like obviously a close contact sport like grappling, it was just a no go. I think we were open for three months. That shut down. That was it. Then we were done. Crazy. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was bad. But then in the December, the guy who had the unit, he basically decided to move his business to the other side of the town into his um, into his partner's unit because I think she was a hairdresser. Then she had some spare space, so we took the, the gamble and went, "Yeah, we'll take on the whole unit, knowing that." There was probably going to be more, like obviously there was more lockdowns, wasn't there, in the, yeah. the Janu- second January. But we knew then we'd be entitled to every single grant that came along. Because we, because like our premises, it wasn't ours, we didn't have the lease for it. We were just subletting. We were entitled to nothing that first year, um, which is rightly so, which is fair enough. But the guy who had the unit, tough, he though. got all the, oh, it was bad, <laughs> yeah. But luckily, fortunately, it wasn't our full time jobs. It's still not our full time job. So, and there was a lot of kindness from all the members. Like the majority of them that we had all paid their membership. So, what we did, we just banked that money. We just left it there. And then, when the unit became ours, all that money then was used to to fully kit out the whole unit. Then, so we've got obviously the big mat space, the big grappling space, and we've got a full sort of strength and conditioning area as well now. So, and that's all like just down to like the people carrying on their membership and all the grants that came from the January till I think it was January to April. Yeah, we've got our last one in the April of 2021. So everything that we got given from the government. So really, COVID was like a little blessing in disguise, really, for us on the fly. Yeah, that's good. So you, you said it was 12 years getting to your black belt. So yeah. where, where were you and what were you doing before you started? So before I started jiu-jitsu, I was in my 20s. I was tie boxing. So okay. obviously knees, elbows, getting kicked in the head. I had nine fights overall with that. So basically I averaged like one fight a year, I think. I just like going out a little bit too much. <laughs> that, that was it. I, I think I was the shudder what the the guy in tie boxing. There's a lot of yeah. yeah there's there's a lot of stories about talented. It could be anything, rugby, football, boxers, a, a, any sports. That there's always a story of a guy who was more talented but couldn't be asked to clean live. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I only got into I only got into sort of Thai boxing because I, I think I only planned to have one fight. That was it. Like I yeah. just have one because it's a scary thing to do. And none of my friends were into it. Um, it all stemmed from just watching John Claude Van Damme films when I was a kid, like yeah. like kickboxing, double blood impact. sport, like, yeah, bl- and, and blood sport, yeah. yeah. All then when I was a kid, so I think, I think that was, was my like, first introduction to Van Damme was blood sport, and I was ho- hooked on him. I was hooked on him then. Fantastic, yeah. So then, subconsciously, I think it was always like there to like you need to do it once, yeah. and then it just carried on from there. But then it just carried on training all the time. At the time, in my 20s, I was working in a gym, so my shift patterns weren't great for getting to class. I was always fit, always, always ready, but then there was always that little bit because I wasn't training as much as I probably should have done. I just didn't have it. I, was, I didn't have that sort of like killer instinct. I think overall, I won, I won three, drew one, and lost the rest, so nine in total. I yeah. So then it comes to like near the end of my 20s, it's like, so what? Can, do you want to be getting punched in the face in your 30s? Because you've had a few late nights when you've been growing up, um, <laughs> and all that, and then I don't want—I didn't want to become like you know. Where you think, do I 
will it affect me later on in life carrying this on? So, but luckily at the time, the gym that I was training at, it's, there was like a day class that got started. Like a, so it's like an MMA and a grappling class. And then you, know, you, just, you, know, you poke your head in and think, well, what yeah. are they doing in there? And then Jaman would join in. And he said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. But he said, will you help us out first, Kev? Will you just do like, there's a guy, I always remember his name, an MMA fighter from Liverpool called Mick Bowman. He had a fight coming up and he said, right, Kev, what we want you to do, you'll just do striking with him and Mick will take you down. He said, he won't hit you on the floor. You'll be fine. I went, okay, yeah, that's fine. I thought, he's not taking me down. <laughs> what are you, think? you don't know what you don't know, do you? And then like, no. I was getting, like, getting suplexed in the air and everything. <laughs> so that was like my introduction to grappling. I just got humbled. I don't think I punched or kicked him once. He just took me down at will over and over again. And it was at that point where you think, you know what, this is it now. This is like yeah. the new direction that I'm going to. Um, so at the time, like the guy who's now my coach, he's been my coach over 12 years. He just arrived back from Spain and he was off in private lessons. So I, I, I it was on a flyer. This is like 12 years ago, how the world's changed then. Like a little flyer in the gym. And I called yeah. it. Like who, who makes yeah. phone calls now? Yeah. Well? For, for people that don't know what a flyer is, it's how we used to talk. <laughs> it's how we used to tell each other we had a business. Yeah. And then like that thing of calling it. Oh, you're yeah. okay, mate. <laughs> yeah. This is like a strange thing now. It's just like an Insta message, isn't it? Yeah. That's how you it's get around to it. You say it like that, you know, people, you would look for a flyer and yeah. and then it, and you'd ring the mobile number on the flyer and it's just like, oh, I, I, I'm phoning up. A, I've got your flyer and I'm phoning yeah. up about <laughs> such and such. <laughs> and the flyer was clearly made on like Microsoft Paint. No, it, it wasn't like a nice, slick um, poster that people get made now from a little graphic designer or a fiver. No, the only like, people that had, soft paint. Yeah, the only people that did slick printing back then was the Chinese and Indian menus. <laughs> and they were pushed yeah. through your letterbox. Yeah, you know, they were always yeah. shiny and glossy. You knew it was a homemade business, like you said, when it's like you've done this on Word, haven't you, mate? Yeah. <laughs> and all like the graphics. Guillotine did it by fuzzy. hand. <laughs> yeah. I think he just like had a, a pair of scissors yeah. back then. <laughs> but, you know, so that's then, where it led me to then. And literally been at it ever since. Twelve years of getting squashed. Getting squashed, give, giving squashings out, cut noses, cauliflower ears. I've been through it all, competing around Europe, competing around the country. And here I am now, 12 years later. So at what level did you compete at for jiu-jitsu then? Um, well, currently now, um, jiu-jitsu, it's not really. There are sorts of pro guys so, so, now. So what is it you what you were competing in then? What is it you're competing in? As in Thai boxing or, or grappling level? Grappling, grappling. Oh, grappling, it's... Well, because there's so many things there, isn't it? Because MMA, jiu-jitsu, yeah. it, it's all kind of... W- once upon a time, everything was... You would, you would did this, or you did this, or you did this. You looked like... like w- when I was growing up, you did you either boxed, did judo, or did taekwondo. Yeah. That, 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 in my area, that, that was what you could do. Whereas now, things are very multidisciplined. And yeah. you're actually kind of expected to know a little bit about everything. Yeah. If you want to compete in MMA, you need to know a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. But just for what I'm doing now, it's just pure grappling. So there's no striking. There's no air. Um, you can't punch or kick them. It's just literally, yeah. if anyone doesn't know what sort of grappling is, everyone sort of has an idea of what judo and wrestling are because they're Olympic yeah. sports. And it's basically sort of the stand-up bit of judo and wrestling, then the takedown. And then it continues on the floor. Jiu-Jitsu always continues on the floor. So the level that I'm at, I've, I'm never going to be a superstar. Um, I compete now in Masters. What am I? How old am I? I'm 38. So the good thing about grappling is it's done in age categories as well. Yeah, so good. Yeah. 18 to 30 is classed as adults. And like there are guys who are there who are elite level. Even like say lower belts now in that adult class, they're yeah. elite now. But now in your 30s, goes 31 to 35, Master 1. Then 35. So every five years, like it goes up another like age bracket. So I'm sitting in master two at the minute and I'm happy with that. I know the level that I'm at now. Probably say I'm at a good level for me age and me, and me weight. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of like superstar, the more like that elite or pro level, I'm not there. But put me with a master two guy or a master one. And yeah. I'll be all right. It's, it's difficult, I was saying, because people don't understand. It's like I don't have a great martial arts background by any stretch of the imagination. Um, when I was a kid, my dad was in the army and I spent two years in Cyprus from 1980 to 82. Um, I learned judo and 
of course, it was my first introduction to judo, and it was taught by a military police officer. So imagine 1960s, 1970s military police officer and the sort of scrapes he gets into. But he actually also is a black belt in judo and qualified to teach judo. And he has, so he opens up, he's in Cyprus, he opens up his judo school, gets all these kids in, and he is literally teaching us how to street fight. Um, Because he was teaching (laughs) us how to strike, and that's not a judo thing. But he used to teach us to spar blindfolded. He would get you, you he'd blindfold you on the mats, two of you, obviously, and he would spin you around so you're dizzy, and then let you find yourself, find each other. (laughs) <laughs> you know I mean? and that's how we learned to fight <laughs> so roll that on two years i go to england i come back to england sign up for the local judo school and i'm like oh this is gonna be great you know but they're, they're like, hold on. <laughs> no 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 i used an elbow on somebody you know I mean? somebody oh, grabbed some that, and i dropped an elbow into his and they went absolutely nuts at me and i never went back I just, I so it seems like your coach, he was teaching probably early MMA before MMA was a thing. Then he was blending, he, striking, and grappling together. He, yeah, he was a, 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 a military policeman. So he was used to grappling squ- squaddies who were drunk and and arresting them. That's how he knew judo. You know? <laughs> I mean, he, he was a legit judo guy, but he was just like, you need to know how to fight. Because he, he had spent his entire... He would have probably at this point had done 15 years, maybe 18 years as an RMP, and he was a sergeant as well. So he, he'd spent 15 to 18 years fighting drunk soldiers so he could arrest them. <laughs> what a job. <laughs> yeah. You know I mean? And and to be fair, he, he, he hadn't lost his look, so he was obviously quite handy. So he, yeah, taught, yeah. <laughs> he taught us what he thought we needed to know. And, like, I think about it now, and, you know, why would you teach kids to fight blindfolded? Because he was all into you've got to be able to feel them, grab them, trip them, hold, you know. It was really intense stuff. But, of course, when you come back to England, come back to the UK, and you go to an affiliated judo school, and suddenly you're kind of street fighting, um, and you know the judo moves, but there's other things you've been taught to do. They just went nuts, and I just couldn't, I couldn't cope with that, and I never went back. And then a couple of times over the years, I've got to boxing gyms and done a lot of sparring, but I, I've never competed or anything. I've, but I've never lost that love for um, kind of boxing and grappling. And and people people don't understand. <laughs> You'll probably get, understand this really well. That the thing about when you go to all of these gyms doesn't matter what it is you've basically got lots of people training to become as fit as they can to get a kick in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically a room full of murderers or trained killers, literally. Yeah, yeah, uh, literally that. And they're really fit. And all they do, and there's this very strange mentality that can be hard to understand sometimes, is they're really only interested in training with somebody they can't beat because otherwise they can't get any better. Yeah. So, And you try to explain that to people it's they just just don't get it they just don't get it and and i can't think i can't remember who it was i think it was a boxer that said the thing about boxing is you get trained um you you basically spend your entire career training as hard as you can to get punched in the face (laughs) it's weird yeah Yeah. and you just like could you imagine that on a flyer come in train really hard and get punched in the face well that's why like like i was talking about this to be business partner the other day the gym it's it's a really hard sell like what we're selling is yeah basically do you want to come around roll on the floor and get strangled yeah nah, you're all right. yeah. <laughs> it's a weird sell it's a weird little sport that we do and try and explain it to someone like oh yeah or like when they go so what is it blah 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 and you explain that and I go oh, okay <laughs> but it, this to me this is I, I can still remember the first time judo really helped me and it was many years later i i was at i'd started secondary school and some kid picked on me and without a, just out of fit thinking about it i threw him over my shoulder i managed to kind of half hit half shoulder for him because he was clumsy taller than me leaned right in just to grab him to show me that he was the bigger guy he was a couple of years older than me and he went in like that and of course i was just there, there was that I couldn't do it now because I haven't done it for years, you know. But it was just like straight away, 
my hip, my feet, everything just moved and he just went straight over the top with me still holding on to his, uh, his hand and keeping him in a wrist lock. And he was just like, do you really want to do this, mate? And you got and, the yip on. <laughs> One bite yip on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> effectively. And, and that's, and it's this strange thing that happens when you know you can do that. And yeah. whenever like you train with like a beginner or even like probably in any martial arts or discipline, if you like, like all sorts of like newer guys think, oh, I'm not getting any better, blah, blah, blah. I would just wait till like a newer person comes in and you'll feel it that you yeah. are. How like sort of like vulnerable people are really to say yeah. someone who, who has done a little bit of training in, the, in their life and who's consistent, still consistent with it. How sort of fragile people are like literally by moving someone's head that way. Yeah, like, People think that they're super strong, but if your head's out of line, you, yeah. your your strength goes. This this, this is it. People um you, you, people do not understand just how like the one of the favorite things in judo when you were standing up was just to shift someone's foot because th they just yeah. weren't paying. And that foot makes you step to one side, and I can just push you on the floor. Mm -hmm. But while I'm pushing you over, I can keep hold of your lead arm or the arm closest to me and just keep hold of your hand and your wrist. And and now you're on the floor and I've got hold of your hand up here. And it's just like, any way you move, I'll just bend your hand the other way <laughs> or I'll twist it. And it, it, it's, I mean, like I said, the, the, there was a, the, there's a skill to it, but, but it, it's not just, I don't now like now I'm so out of practice and so clumsy. I'm more likely if I try to move your front foot, I'm more likely to roll my own ankle and fall over on my own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. I think any martial arts, it's a thing. People think there's obviously not everyone thinks that like all fighters or martial arts are all brain dead. They're not, you've got yeah. to think, yes, yeah. you, you have to think. It's a very clever process, I think, especially grappling because a lot of move, literally a lot of moving parts going on. You have to think, like, I literally that's why sometimes I'll concentrate on my head, it's like fried, yeah. I say going against going someone who's a lot more skilled than me. They're just outthinking me. So sometimes I'm mentally fatigued as well. I know what they're doing, but they're just that far ahead. Like yeah. my brain can't keep up, and then my body then slows down against them. But then when you do it, like to someone who's not as good as you, they're mentally and physically drained as well. I, I remember because like judo, especially and wrestling is the same. It's a chess game. And but I remember the first time I, I like it's funny because I'm talking to you and all these memories are coming back of times I've scrappled and sparred, and and you're talking memories from forty years ago, for, you know. And I can remember the first time somebody just you, you're grappling with somebody they just pulled on one side and they just keep keep that tension there and tension there and tension there and you're like, oh, I don't know. but then three or four minutes in, you're starting to get really tired. And you never realised their whole game plan was just to make you tired. Yep. And so you never counted that one move, uh, you know, or the, the classic one where somebody pulls or pushes and, and keeps doing it, keeps doing it and keeps doing it. And you start to anticipate them doing it and they don't. They really change it up. Then yeah. Full sweep, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're just like, I've just been played. God. And, and like you say, these people, there's people that are at levels that they're, 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 they're five, six, moves ahead or two minutes ahead of where you are you think right you start to grapple and you're like it's like playing like i said it's like playing chess you, you get into a game with someone if they're really good they've already decided their first 15 moves and you're still yeah. thinking right where do i put that pawn okay there and it's like they're fifth they don't care, even care what you're trying to do <laughs> or that or they're that well trained they're literally they're subconscious they're just going they're just in autopilot and they're just going boom 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 and then they're not thinking then so they're not getting tired the body's not getting tired neither yeah. and they're not even wondering what you're trying to do no they don't care no do not care <laughs> don't care <laughs> <laughs> that that's the, the most humiliating thing you you get this and i've got this in boxing as well is um i, I remember sparring this kid i would have been a bit crikey i i would have been about 40 and I was sparring with this kid, and he was about 18. And he lighter than me, smaller than me. And he, but he boxed at uh, British level, uh, you know, national level. And he, God bless him to this day, because he never took advantage of me. Mm. But it was blatantly obvious. It didn't matter to him what I did. 
<laughs> it's like you were in slow motion and it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like it was at the end of the Matrix, you know, the first yeah. one when Neo's just yeah. like, I just, oh, right, yeah, yeah, okay. And, it, and yeah. it's just, it's, uh, I move forward and, it, it, yeah, I, I don't think I even laid a punch on him, you know. <laughs> um, and he just, he just like, j just like literally gently just jab and tap me uh, just for That's his good. own immunity for his own amusement. That's what I'm saying. He never took any advantage of me. You know, he's just like, he, he understood levels. He, he needed sparring. I had to spar as well. And it's just like, there's no point giving an old man a, a hiding. There's nothing in it for me. And, and yeah, he just practiced what he wanted to practice without actually banging me out. And That's um, good. yeah, yeah. He was, he was a top quality guy. You know, he was a really nice guy. Like it. Um, but it, it was just so amusing for me because it's so tiring just throwing into thin air and yep. stepping towards somebody. And because, like, people have said, you, you, you step in and throw, <clears throat> and when they're really good, that's when they move. You know, people at my level will, will always try and stay out of range or always try and stay too close because I don't have the skill set or the agility to anticipate more than that. But when they're really good, they're just moving, like you said, just a slight head movement. And yeah. they're, they're not there anymore. It's like they're just they glide. It's like the ice. I have compared to it's like they're just ice and they just glide and they just glide. So like you, you see them glide around. It's effortless. It is effortless. And you know, and you're just like this clumsy hippo just bouncing around, sort of, <laughs> <laughs> trying, <laughs> trying your best to look graceful. Like still thinking, yeah, like I'm 21 in the head, but you know, the body's just falling to bits. <laughs> It, yeah, that, that's that, that's exactly what happens. Is that they're just you, you, like you say, you know, your head is just like, oh yeah, yeah, I can do this, I can do this, and your body's just like, okay, nah, mate. Not today, mate. Yeah, not today, lad. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll let you get through the ropes, but you're going to learn rapidly. You know, there's <laughs> yeah. a different there's a difference between they have to do the burpees and the press ups and actually sparring. Yeah, there's levels to this game, man. <laughs> so now that you know, like like me we've done the hypnosis practitioner course. How are you finding, are you able to utilize that with anybody? I have, yeah. Um, took on some clients recently. Um, I think about, about, about six or seven. And then and I did a little seminar as well in a, a local nice. gym as well. So they asked me to do just a small little workshop. We did some, did hack, we did the hackle out tech. So it was in preparation for competing. So I think there's about 20 of them in the room. I was like, right, before you maybe step onto the mat, do the hackle out technique. We did some anchoring as well to get them into that like good positive state where they like maybe where they were thinking they were fit, they were strong, they were confident, they were powerful. And I just did two or three really simple ones like that with them. But since the course, like that course in particular was one that I wanted to really do. So sort of again, because I've done like a man coaching coach be so course before, but there was a little bit that I thought that I was missing my hypnosis bit because I did one online and it, it, it was good. It was very good, but the learning's different. I, I prefer to be in the classroom because yeah. you can pick up on, you can ask the, the tutor things. You can ask people around you other things. You can get their feedback. And let's see then just people's like voice tone and like the way their eyes are moving, just checking their facial cues, just to check understanding. But overall I've loved it ever since. And it was that piece that, of the puzzle that I was missing to go forward. And, actively pursue it a bit more trying to help people at that a little bit more now because i've got that more confidence and that new skill set under my belt now one of the things that i noticed there was two things that i noticed i was missing apart from actually knowing how to hypnotize somebody is because i do a lot of my coaching like this i don't really pay attention to rapport and because i put a lot of my content on social media people contact me and, you know, like with your, your Instagram, you know, people will see that and then come down and mm -hmm. you're, you're not selling them anything because they're already curious enough that they've made the introduction. So th that I found for me that worked because it broke down lots of barriers immediately because people knew what I looked like. They knew the sound of my voice mm -hmm. and they, they almost knew exactly what I would say. So <clears throat> they're almost to kind of term the phrase, they're all already in that trance state. Um, like you feel like they know you a little bit already. Exactly. So I yeah. was never, and I noticed this on the course, I was never paying any attention to re building rapport. 
because you've already reached out to me. So I wasn't paying attention to body language. I wasn't paying attention to visual cues because I just didn't need to. And, and then when we started learning about the NLP side of it and the way that we can use language, I was just like, I'd missed all of that because it j j just, no, there wasn't even a reason. I just wasn't aware of it. And that, and actually, originally, my interest in coaching came from NLP. <clears throat> but somehow, again, through that online stuff, uh, social media and things, I'd forgotten about the importance and benefits of why we should and shouldn't use NLP and how you should use it and how you shouldn't use it, you know. And it was just, yeah, it was just crazy that that happened. And so that, that for me was a big thing about that weekend, of, you know, on top of the, uh, just Kevin and I were talking about this before we started recording. The, the first time you see Vinnie Shawman put somebody under just like, literally within seconds and you don't see him, how he's done it. And it, it's just like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got lots to learn. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. to learn. So, just give everybody um, a a breakdown of the the hackle out technique. It's one of my favourite ones, actually, and it's something that when I first met Vinny eight years ago, and I did Vinny's four weeks to freedom course, I think that was the very first technique that we did. Um, I think it's especially good for combat sports athletes. It's, it's the I I do it all the time before, always before I step on the competition mat even while I'm warming up, and then literally as I'm on the mat, about to go on before the referee calls me on. So it's always a it's a very basic technique. Um, you can pick any spot above you, so above your eye line, uh, and just focus on that one spot. Um, I use it to calm my mind, um, calm the nervous system down, and sort of the cues, like when I'm teaching it to people, is imagine you can look all the way to the right, all the way to the left, all the way above you, and all the way below. And again, you literally feel, like I do, you know, my eye opens up so much, I can see, like, like the whole room. Like, it's weird, and I think it's brilliant for combat sports athletes, because the subconscious then can see what your opponent's doing. Whereas like, if you just got maybe that tunnel vision, and you know, that's it, you just focus on just directly in front. Especially with combat sports, there's lots of little micro-movements, that, like, if it's either a feint or the way they move their foot, the way they move their head before they do something. And if your subconscious picks up on that, you then react a lot faster compared to, let's say, if you're just in tunnel vision and your opponent moves, and then you've got to then react to them. If you can sort of react that little half yeah. millisecond before them, I find it's brilliant. That's one of the best techniques that I've ever been taught. And I've also used it before exams as well, just to calm down, just to really calm down. Like when I was doing my PGC, um, you had to take um, a skills maths test and you only got three goes at it and then you were time barred then for two years. I'd failed it twice. <laughs> so I'm like, shit, <laughs> I'm in the shit here. If I fail this, I've got to wait two years before I can qualify. And I'm there. I think I was in the toilet just before the exam doing it. Like folks are looking up in this, in this cubicle doing it. And again, but I walked in just nice and steady because I think I'd seen Vinny. I think I had my last session with Vinny or my first session with Vinny before that last test and then obviously passed it with flying colours which was good it's, it's, it is because people one of the things that I find like the when we did that weekend together everybody in that room is obsessed with mindset and obsessed we are so obsessed with eradicating limiting beliefs it, it, it's, it's crazy because you actually, I, I joke with my friends that when I go to these courses, um, it's like this is the second time I've been to go with uh, Vinnie Shawman. And like about a third of that room were ex fighters, ex world champions, or train fighters and champions. And it, it's quite, um, I've forgotten the chaps correct name so i do apologize in advance the chat that um vinnie kept referring to is otto from the simpsons um i can't remember his name you know who i mean don't you was he on the course yeah 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 he was which sat one's, which, which one's otto <laughs> he was sat was he? Uh, in the <laughs> top right hand corner as you work through the door and he, he always had a big cap curly on hair and a beard 
Yeah. Okay. Rick. Yeah, Rick. Rick. That's it. Rick. Rick Barnell. Barnell. Yeah. Rick Barnell. Yeah. The the the, the nicest, most pli- pleasant guy you go. But I looked him up absolute afterwards. Absolute killer. <laughs> yeah. I was showing friends pictures of that. I was like, I just, I'd just been on this course of him. Nicest guy going. This is him, at, like ten years ago when he was this two-time world Muay Thai champion, and he's, and he's just like, he just couldn't believe, like you say, he's just a killer. But again, yeah. another, another guy who's obsessed with mindset, eradicating self, um, negative thinking, eradicating. Um, <clears throat> And anything that will under any self doubt, anything that undermine getting the most effectiveness, the most effective ways of moving forward. Yep. And and that's one of the things I find really interesting about those courses is it's funny how many of us, if you put all of us together, we are incredibly confident, but we doubt ourselves. Yeah, everyone does. Yeah, and that, You're that's kind of, you say you don't. But that's the thing you kind of learn. Is I'm in this room full of people like yourself, thinking, "Fucking hell, fucking hell." But you've got the same self doubts as I've got. Yeah, but even that room, I thought there was a that room was full of. I don't think the words like high achievers and very competent people in their field. I thought everyone in there was like a meta human. I thought, yeah, but, and they all deal with people like you said who. A lot of them were PTs or they were fighters or they deal with people who come to them. Like they probably see so much potential in like maybe their clients or their fighters, but their clients and their fighters are self sabotaging themselves because they just don't believe in themselves. And again, it all comes, all comes back to that limiting belief. The amount of people who that I've seen who should have worked, like I was the should have worked, could have guy because I didn't believe, I didn't have the mental tools to be a decent fighter. But then after getting it fixed by Vinny, yeah. I've then gone on. I've took that forward into grappling. So imagine, I was like to look back, I imagine if I found Vinny maybe nine years before I did. Like, who knows? Yeah. No, I, no, I agree. I agree. I, I wandered through life aimlessly for 40 years, you know, and, and you could even argue 45 years, you know, and just before I suddenly actually, it actually took somebody stitching me up for me to take my coaching seriously. Yeah. 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 Somebody, uh, I was started a business and it was somebody and they screwed me and I was just like, okay, you've got to start, you've got to take yourself seriously and build this up on your own and do it on your own. And I'm flying, you know, it's getting better all the time. I started a podcast, you know, I started actually getting clients and, and things like that. And I started networking, you know, all of these things, but it actually took something to kind of partly destroy me to realize why are you trying to get validation from other people for your actions? Why are you self sabotaging lives? What is it you think those people can give you that you can't do for yourself? You know, it's just like, and he's just like, right, yeah, you just got to take those steps and start believing in yourself. It's very easy to partner up with people if you don't believe in your in yourself. Mm-hmm. It seems like a, a blessing disguise, that doesn't it? A lot, it a lot of like sorts yeah. of people's major successes come from maybe like a trauma or something really bad that's happened or they've been like say screwed up in business yeah. and I think that sounds okay this is what I need to do like they've seen the positives in it yeah it is it's, it's and it's funny that that's kind of you know like I said it wasn't like it was a big massive business it was something that was just being talked about started about and a little bit of investment and then it, it just I kind of got completely ghosted and the person disappeared but it was that that took me to think right you've got to take yourself seriously because you're actually the one coming up with all the ideas. You're the one doing all the work, but you keep trying to do it for somebody else sort of thing. It yeah. wouldn't just, just do it for yourself. And it's just like, Oh, right. And it sounds really simple when you say it like that, but when your mindset is in a different location to the direction you need to actually go, you don't see the directions. So have you ever heard of that guy? I think he's a podcast in America called Jocko Willink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ex Navy yeah. SEAL. Yeah, yeah. Everything like is like answer to everything is good, isn't it? Let's say this happened, good. Fine, we'll find a better way. Blah blah blah. And every like thing or every like problem that people come to, he goes good. Yeah, <laughs> I, I remember listening to him once talking about when they used to have like um, they would go and see the the commanding officer and everything and. 
when the, you turn up and it's just like these supplies haven't turned up we haven't got this we haven't got that yeah good right we're not moaning about it we're not talking about it we're working around it we're, we're getting on we have a job to do i don't care if we don't have this i don't care if we don't have that i don't care if somebody hasn't done this but that's not our job is not to do worry about that bitch about that waste time or energy trying to well just sounding out something that cannot be fixed or cannot be changed what have we got what can we do yeah and you're like oh right well that that that's and that, that when you listen to things like that it's, it's a real eye opener because that's how those people succeed yeah it's a great youtube clip i think like that clip must have millions of views like like the guy that he works with that echo charles i think they made a clip like a good if you just google um or youtube uh jocko willing good it's, it's a brilliant i love yeah. it he he is i mean he's yeah th people like that um and like david goggins they're they're just like i don't know I, I don't know how to describe them because on one hand everybody has that same potential yeah but you just like crikey the the levels of str stress that they just don't just doesn't touch them they seem to have really sort of like a phoenix up the flame they've uh, their life's been shaped by a lot of trauma and bad things so, like especially goggins he seems to have had like a lot of struggle early, early on in his life and he's yeah. really harnessed it he's used it and he's come up the other side so everything sort of good that he's achieved has come from it's, if you if you ever listen read his autobiography or listen to it on audio um there's some parts of it that are quite repetitive but if you love mindset you kind of understand where he's coming from like you know like where his own dad offered threatened to shoot him in the face when he was like seven years old and stuff like that and you know the abuse he took um for being a black kid in a white neighborhood and and all of these things and being overweight and the amount of things he failed at just yeah. kept failing kept failing and he just like nothing hurt him more than the way he was treated as a kid and stuff like that and he just yeah he he cultivates all of that you know that you can't touch me you can't hurt me you know and like he calls it like taking souls but one of the things that's interesting <laughs> when he's in the book he talks about how he actually started getting kickbacks from other navy seals because he was never satisfied and when he was in charge of training his own company he actually got isolated because they started to hate him because he was just like you can't train we're not training hard enough we're not training hard enough whereas he's and this is one of the things he talks about is you have this mindset of like we're navy seals if we've passed the courses we've done that we're good and he's like, no, motherfuckers, we got to be even better. Yeah. And he said, and he said, like ninety percent of the troop, or the company, whatever, just like just disengaged with him. It's like, no, nah, that's not us. And it was just in the end, it was just him and another guy who were training harder than everyone else. And he was just like, as far in his mindset, he was just like, I'm embarrassed to be a Navy SEAL like you. <laughs> and all these other guys like, I get it, I get it. And he was like, oh, mate, I'm not going for a run. Be asked. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But this is what, but this is what it's just like. They were doing all. Of, they were up to all the fitness standards that required for being a Navy SEAL. But he was like, "No, we're going to be the best Navy SEALs ever in the history of Navy SEALs. We're going to run thirty miles every day, and we're going to do this every day, and we're going to do this." And they're like, "No, I'm not doing that. I've passed all my tests. I'm, I'm up to sketch." Yeah, no, man. We're going to be elite. We already are elite. No, we're going to be elite, elite. And they're just like, "No, no, no, mate." and that's th 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 there's something not right in that mindset no he's not i think that's a bit too much at times yeah the, 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 and it's at the expense of everything else absolutely everything else he's probably got no mates at all no one wants to like go for like a baby with him or meet up with him <laughs> this is it when he does like he says the odd guy that did train with him that is because they're on the same level as him mentally you know, to just yeah okay yeah I, I'll do four thousand reps with you. If <laughs> you just like okay you know but but that's it that those people and the way they it, and this is I think what like you and I were uh, talking about earlier is it's all just mindset. Yeah. Uh, so one of the so what just I want to go quickly back to something else you were talking about the anchoring technique. Yeah. 
that's one of my, it's still one of my favourite ones. Again, I learned it eight years ago and then now I'm sort of teaching it towards people. I think it's especially good for, again, you can use it in any walk of life. I, I just refer to it for combat sport athletes because I deal with a lot of them I'm around them every day. So again, it's just anchoring certain states into a physical part of your body. Some people like to put, say, their boxing gloves together. Some people like to put their knuckles together. Some people like to go there. So we like to just touch a certain space. So my a couple of ones that I always use, especially if I'm doing like a little seminar or a little workshop or if I'm teaching at another gym or even just before sometimes, class in my own gym, it's like a little confidence anchor, it's like yeah. that one. Even like before I came on so this. So just for uh, references, fire, if, uh, thumb to four finger to thumb. Yeah, yeah. Like, that, yeah. like that's my confidence anchor. Mm-hmm. And it all stems from that one time that you're feeling super confident, which was me teaching in my own gym. And I can literally, as soon as I do that, I can transport it back there. The room's full. We're flowing through the techniques. Everyone's getting it. And that's my confidence anchor. I, I, I fire it off before maybe, I say, something new. Just fire it off. And another one, a calm slash maybe happy one. Yeah. I touch my knee. I, t- I touch my yeah. knee. And that one always just transports me back to a Saturday night. There's me, one of the dogs in the middle. And the myth, I'm so free from the other half on the end of the couch. That's it. Because, you know, everything's fine. All the family are okay. And that's it. Just sitting on the couch with the dog. That's your happy one. I fire them off all the time. It's funny because people laugh about these things. But the first one I ever I ever heard of is Elvis Presley in his 1,000-yard walk, his 100-yard walk. And I don't know if you heard about this. but. No. So Elvis Presley, everybody knows Elvis Presley on the stage. That guy, that presence. I mean, he was probably he was probably the guy that s- people started to understand what stage presence was about was because of it, uh, someone like Elvis Presley. But he talked about um, that's not what he was like off stage. And it, it was he'd put on all the all the gear, all the hair, looked like Elvis Presley, and then it was the hundred yard walk to the stage. He would turn into Elvis Presley. Yeah, and that's and it's. He said every show, he has this thing where he would have to walk onto the stage, and in the process of taking those steps, he turned himself into Elvis Presley. Mm-hmm. But it reminds me, it's like you got Wimbledon on at the moment. All the tennis players with their little routines, and people call them superstitions. No, 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 they're their anchors. They're yeah. set in their mind. And that, that's why they tie their shoelaces, move their bottles. And it's not a superstition. It's not an OCD. I mean, it might be as well, but actually what that is, is just their brain has been trained. If I do this sequence, I will feel like this. Yeah. And again, are you saying Elvis transforms himself? Even like there's days in the gym where maybe I've done a full day in work and then I go straight to gym and I'm knackered. I've got to transform into Kev the instructor I'm like, oh I'm tired today and then that because that energy then feeds into the rest of the room like you say as soon as like, I may be putting my gear on or I'm putting me like my shorts on that's it as soon as I, and I, and I walk to that mass as soon as I step on the mass you have to you change your state instantly you do yeah you like you say you have to turn up and do a performance yeah and the thing that's very difficult with con- compact sports you can't fake performance Oh, they'll see if I can yeah. or you'll get smashed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one that'll happen. Everyone will see you get yeah. smashed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got to turn up. Every day at the gym, when I'm teaching, I've got to turn up. And then they say, even if I've, I've got to fake being amazing. But then as soon as I step off, I say, and everyone's gone, I'm like, <sighs> tired now. And that's, I think, Be tired again. something that's in, important for people to understand with mindset. Nobody carries it 24-7. It, it's... Having it when you know you need it. And I've recently been playing around with the idea of confidence and that real confidence is not being afraid to fail, but is knowing that when it matters, that's when you'll turn up. And you can be feeling really nervous. You can, and this is like that real confidence, that real courage is you do feel nervous, you do have self-doubts and, and all of these things. But when it matters, and I was about to start going, you will notice, <laughs> moving forward, um, that, but when 
when it matters, that's when you turn up and, and you practice that so that, and weirdly what happens then is you're not worried about the fact you don't feel like that in eight hours time. It doesn't matter that you didn't feel like that yesterday. What matters is you know that you, as soon as it, you have to do it, you can rely on yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of where I am with confidence these days. Fucking confidence. Yeah, like you say, not being afraid to fail and then turn it up when it matters. Yeah, because especially like with social media and stuff like that, and when I was younger as well, you'd see people who were confident. And you 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 think that that's how they walk around twenty four seven, and you, no. you, yeah, that's that's exactly. It. I think someone said to me the other day, "Oh, you must be happy all the time. You doing what you're doing? Well, I'm not. <laughs> not happy twenty four seven. So I don't think that'd be healthy, would it? No. And that's what I mean. I think we get obsessed that this mindset thing is a constant. But then I always like say to people, I've got tools that I use to help me if, I don't know, let's say whatever X, Y, Z happens, I can then steer myself back to where I want to feel. Yeah. But it is natural to feel like a little bit low or, or really happy. It's like that, isn't it? Life in general. And we, we talk about that in therapy, that um, one of the ways you know you've gotten over something, over traumas and things like that, is it's not that the when it repeats itself because people think there's this whole thing in spirituality that once you've learned a lesson it doesn't repeat itself and it's just like no that, that's not what happens the lesson is always there it's just once you once you've learned how to handle it the next time that lesson reappears you navigate it differently because of your experience and because of what you let go and what you evolved and how you move forward so you mm -hmm. you, you navigate it. like like when you get better at sparring the, the, the person that is new thinks they're shit that, but six months down the line, when they then spar with the person who's just walked through the door, they realise how much better they are. Yeah. But in everyday problems, people don't realise how they've evolved and how gifted they've become. But, um, because they're navigating those same problems differently. Yeah. And, and that's why they think that's not they're not being affected by it. Yeah. So what's the future for you in the school then? goal is for it to be my full-time job so at the minute i'm still working every day i'm a, a work on supply i'm a teacher a qualified PE teacher or just work on agency um i just won't take a job at a full-time school it's not for me yeah so that's the goal if there was one of us just running the club if there's a good full-time way to there for it because it's too much we split it but i think going forward like working in schools lately it's it's just not for me no more there's when, when working in school is good it's good but then when it's bad it's bad yeah if i'm not on pa obviously to qualify a qualified pe teacher and i've got to like cover like a maths lesson or i mean i've got a full day where i'm not covering pa and i've got to go in the shirt and tie it's not for me i think yeah. my ideal working uh, attire i like being successful is me in my shorts in my gear in, in a pair of flip-flops that's success for me dressing how I want to dress, comfortable. And then as I think, as me and my partner, we're looking to start a family in the next couple of years, then I'll have that flexible working. So she'll, she's a teacher as well. She's a full-time teacher though. So I'll have that little bit of flexibility during the day. So I think <laughs> I'll be like the stay-at-home dad. I'm sure I'll be yeah. the, uh, the house husband, which is good. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so that's You're going to be like some of the other dads that turn up at school though for the school run, are you? Yeah, I'll be there with all the mums having a little chat. And I'll, I'll be like the... Uh, like the, the front gate brigade, <laughs> if you wanted that. <laughs> so that's a long-term goal with it. But I realise we've only been open properly since when the gyms were all allowed to open properly last year. So yeah. really, even though we opened in 2020, I'm, I'm not counting that 18, that first 18 months. Like We've only been open a year properly. And we're growing all the time. We've got a really successful kids programme at the minute. So our kids programme, we can't allow any other kids in. So it's like a, it's, it's turned into like a little development squad now because I can't have basically the match chocker put them all. Yeah. So we've said no more kids in and we'll see how far we can push this lot. So that's a long-term goal with them. And then obviously to build the adults. Well, I think we're up to about 
40 adult members at the minute. And again, I just want that to grow steadily, like a nice steady pace. Because I can look around, like I'm guilty of it. I always say to people, oh, to just focus on you, blah, blah, blah. But I look around at a couple of my friends who've got schools and they've got like close to 100 members or they're over 100 members. But then I think they've been over around six to 10 years. Yeah. And I was like, just again, refocus back on us. Be grateful for what we've got for now and look that we are building on it after the year. It must be that when you've got kids um, and they're doing well, there must be a part of you that is looking forward because somewhere in that crowd, you know there's a potential champion. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There's a few potential champions in that uh, little group, but if you'll stick at it, that's yeah, that, the thing. Do, do I mean, but that's what I mean, because it's like, it must be very difficult not to sort of look at them and kind of visualise them like, you'll be a national champion. If you, if you stick at this, you could yeah. be... And, and like, people don't realize that sometimes that guy you've seen who's the european champion or the world champion the only difference between him and another person was he never stopped or she never yep. stopped they never quit yep. and they yep. were not the best fighters they just never quit and there's a, a youtube clip by a high-ranking black belt in america he goes it's not who's the best it's who's left that's why yes. he says that and he's yeah. been on the map for like 30, 40 years. And the amount of people that he's seen, even like the amount of people that I've seen, and so you could have been all right. You know, even like as an adult, and they, they just stopped. And then same with the kid. And you think, God, you could have been good. But I think my goal for the kids, like I don't really push competition on them. If they want to yeah. compete, they, they're fine, they can. But at the minute, there's some that probably could do really well in competition, but I don't want them to compete. If they haven't come to me and said, I'd like to do a competition, I don't even mention it. But that's the thing is that you, um, as well, because, you know, with your level of experience is that, you know, if they, if they want to compete, they'll seek, they'll s seek it. They'll, they'll come. It's in them. You. Yeah. It's just in them. Yeah. yeah. There's a couple that have said, even like after a few months, they went, can I compete? And you can just see it in them. We've got one kid, uh, like his nickname's the devil. He's just got evil in him. But obviously he's the sweetest little kid, but when yeah. he's on that mat, he's the devil. <laughs> and he's tiny. He is the devil. <laughs> It's, but it's in him, in him to compete. He's played competitive sports all his little life. He's played football, things, or a few other things. But it's just in him. Where's him? I can't push him. But the others are not. Yeah. And so, so for you, the business will grow to. Like, well, is there a limit on how big you want it to get? Good question. I think the more, I think for I think the unit that we've got and the, and the the rate that we pay, I'd like to stay in the unit that we're in. We've got a good size space. Obviously, we've got the strength and condition area. I think I wouldn't want to move because we're in a good location. We're close to a motorway and a few little towns close to that. And then the cost of all the units in the area, ridiculous. They're not much bigger than what we've got. I think we pay. I think our rent is um, seven fifty a month, and that's really good. It's really good. Yeah. It's, it's basically a garage what we're in. But it's perfect for us. So I think as the school grows in members, that will be then when I can start dropping days in my day job because I because because it, it's agency work. You just say, "Oh, I'm not working today," or you, yes. you can plan your week. I want to work Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and that's when I then probably put on a day class. So then that accommodates then more people coming in. So that's, I would like it to grow exponentially. <laughs> that, that's the thing, you, you got to, one of the things, I, I bang on about this a lot on social media, um, because people just don't kind of get it. You have to have a plan. Yeah. You know, and people say, oh yeah, but I knew this person and it all fell into place for them. Yeah, but it, it's not falling into place for you, is it? And that's because you don't yeah, have yeah. a plan. You know, yeah. and you, you can guarantee whenever I've had a conversation with somebody when it's all fallen into place, when you talk How to long them, it took? <laughs> yeah, it's the length of time it took, and they always knew what they wanted to do. They, it was that simple. So, and that's why they were always so carefree about it because they were never distracted about anything else. It's just like, oh yeah, I want to do X, Y, and Z. So, there's a couple of things that I want to finish on. But um, if somebody, we'll, we'll focus on like the the, the mindset and, and sticking with that. What did people get right? In terms of what? 
I'll, I'll hand that over to you. If when you're an instructor, like you say, when you do a seminar, when you do a seminar, so I, I'll explain the reason I always ask what people do right is because I noticed um, a few years ago you watch videos and you watch people talking about ten things that people do wrong, or ten things that you do wrong, or ten reasons why it's not working for you, and when you watch them, you come away from it knowing 10 things not to do, but you don't know what you do, what you should be doing. So yeah. they were, they're never helpful. So I always try and ask the question, what do people do right? So when you're an instructor or you, and you're about to start that seminar, what, what do you want to see people doing? That's a good question. <laughs> Side swipe me there. Uh, I think, I may just change my answer slightly. I think overall over the years, what I've noticed people getting right is that they've just been consistent. Consistency is key. Yeah, is. Even if they train once a week or do something once a week, they've done it once a week consistently. We've got, like I was related back to the couple of the older guys and the couple of the guys who are mid 40s plus. They've got families, got businesses, et cetera, et cetera. It's got one guy, Graham trains twice a week in class he does a round or two and then he's done and then on a Saturday morning which is our big sparring day he does three and then he stops and he's consistent with that every week always got another guy Peter Farmer Pete 66 still on the mat yeah. I know, I know. And he's, just come back from a, he's just come back from a hip replacement two weeks ago and he's in he does two a week one or two a week, every week. It's consistency, I, I've found. Same with anything, just consistency. Be consistent. So I, I, I'm, I'm interested in Farmer Pete now. Um, oh, he's a legend. So 66, is, and is he, like, holding his he's own on the good. map? He's is very a, good. He's still destroying people if he wanted to. Yeah, he is. He's a, he's a killer. Farmer Pete is a purple belt, so it goes white, blue. Purple, brown, black. He's purple. He's in that advanced stage. He started grappling when he was 58, 57. We've got 10 yeah. years to go yet then. Yeah, he's um, beat, um, beat cancer twice and still came back <laughs> to thingy. He's a typical, like, I say you'd imagine, a farmer. Big hands, yeah. like tall man, about 6'1". Still barely, still got like the death grip because he's been like just lifting cows and hay and potatoes all his life. <laughs> like That's true, though. Farmer. If something's in their way, they just, I'll just move that. Yeah, it's just, lift, yeah. just lifting, lifting every day. And now, obviously, machinery's come along. He was an old-school farmer, and his dad was as well. He's still wrecking guys in their 20s. He has a very slow and methodical game, but once yeah. he gets his game going, or he gets on top, or he grabs your jacket, like, you cannot get rid of that grip. And he's just been consistent. Same with like his, even his physical training over the years. Obviously his farm work, he's been consistent with it. And he's always done like a strength session, I think, or two every week, all his life on top of his work. Because I say to him, so what's like the key to like longevity? He says, keep going. Yeah. I just keep, he's got to keep moving. That's it. I just keep moving. I keep young. I keep moving. Whereas like he has friends who, he says, oh, they're like the dad and the poor boy. Like they're like, I don't know, playing dominoes or whatever, he said. And they're, they're just really unmobile, whereas he's there. He's on the map with all the young guys every week. He knows his limits, but he's consistent. So consistency. So the I, love last I love that man. So do I, and I've met him. Mm. Like the, but it, it, it's, it's, there's something about that that you just... It just gives you hope. Because you know, I'm 47, I'm 48 this year. And like, you know, you, you've seen me, I'm, I'm not in looking at me. I'm not in great physical shape, um, but I still train four times a week. And what, one of my training sessions the other day is just a 40 kilogram sandbag. And you just pick it up and throw it over your shoulder a hundred times. And it doesn't care, matter if it takes me 40 minutes or an hour. Uh, so, and the only do reason- the basics. <laughs> yeah. that, I, that I just do it because when lockdown happened, I was just like, how do I keep training? And so I just set up a garden set up, managed, and it grew into like a tin roof and I've never gone back to a gym. And it's just the basics, burpees, press ups, um, leg throughs. I've got some weights. Um, 
but yeah, I'm still agile. I can still move a lot quicker than I look like I can move. Yeah. Um, and it is, it's just that consistency. And the reason I kept that consistency up is I know it won't it happen. Eventually I'll get back to a place where I can either have my own gym proper or I will um, go back to a gym and I'll get back to that like 13 and a half stone six pack guy. But right now I still work out like that guy. I just eat and drink a little bit more freely. Um, so got to my, enjoy life. Got to enjoy life. Yeah. Yeah, you do. So as, so th- as an instructor, the one thing you see that makes a difference is consistency. In terms of mindset, what do you see people get right? Trying to think. The ones who have done really well, they haven't been afraid to fail, like, like what we touched on earlier. They were open to failure over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Got to be open to that. And they realise, you know what, I, I always say it's like any new person that comes in. You've got to accept, especially in our sport, you've got to accept that you're going to be shite for a while. You're going to be terrible for a while. <laughs> accept the fact that you're going to be dog shit for a good while. You know, as you said that, one of, yeah, one of the things that gave me confidence on that course is it was, I found it really interesting how quickly everybody was happy to talk about what they failed at. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's, as soon as you said that about being happy to fail, uh, I was just like, and like Vinny talks about that. It's not criticism, it's feedback. Every time you yeah, did yeah. something wrong and he publicly calls you out on it in front of the other 12 people in the room, he's like, it's not criticism, it's feedback. Yeah. And when you see all of us, the way we're reacting to that feedback and people talking about what they got wrong and everyone's doing it, it's just like it gave a weird, gave me a, 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 a confidence boost. It's a power. It's a it power. was, yeah, it was, it was it's really, power. and like I said, because there's a lot of high performance guys in that room, mm. and and it's very. That's easy. What I think. Sorry, go on. I was going to say it's very easy to feel intimidated. I sort of think like with the school system. That's why I, um, I probably won't take a full time job in a school again because the fear of failure. I think kids, uh, it's programmed like you can't get it wrong. And I don't think that's right at all. That failing is part of the learning process. I but think like that in our yeah. Sorry, our I was class. I so really go on. Yeah, yeah. Place here. Uh, yeah. So I was just going to say, but I think that's why people like you and I would do really well in the future. Yeah. Because people will come to us who've gone through the school system, and the first thing we're going to do is just give them a hug and say it's okay to fail. Even now, like what I've twenty twenty two, it's still that old school thing in schools where kids are afraid to fail where like in our kids class in the gym i say something right try it out get it wrong it's okay to get it wrong and like you see them go you can see like they relaxed they all know now because they've been with us now a few months where it's just them and they know how myself and john teach right okay go get it wrong okay it's okay to fail and then come to me and we'll, and we'll fix it and they're all flying and their development has gone like that because of that they're not afraid to fail and like I say, at the end of every class, we give them like a little, little, little pep talk again. We always, like we use the word feedback. We don't use like, there's no losing in here. There's no getting beat. It's all feedback again. Like the way like me and John speak, like, I've like changed the way John speaks a little bit, like his vocabulary to the kids. Um, is that it's all feedback? There's no winning or losing in here. It's just feedback. Are you going to, are you hoping to be able to do more seminars and go around to more schools and like, Definitely, I'd like to do. I'd like to do more in other gyms, combat sports gyms. But I'd like to take it then into sc- school schools like, to get this stuff in there as well. Because yeah. I think would, a lot of people don't know about it. I would. I would as well. I. I, I think there's um, a great opportunity for people like you and I to get into schools. And one one of my first one of my favorite questions to ask anybody is when do you want me to take you seriously? Good question. Yeah. And what are the answers that you're getting from that? People always pause because they don't know what to say. I've never had that question asked. Yeah. Because if I, if I say to you, when do you want me to take you seriously? Your instinct is to say now. But you, you, want, you want to know why I asked the question. And then 
my 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 follow up question is: What habits do you have that mean I would take you seriously? Okay. Do you know what I mean? So this is, and then you can so like with like especially like if you take children and something like that, like teenagers, you know. So you can say like, when how old do you want how old do you want to be when I start taking you seriously? And they have to think about how old they're going to be. Um, and then you follow it up like, how old do you want to be when you leave your parents' house? And you know, they because they when you're at school, you want to leave home straight away. Yeah. So once you've got all of these ages and numbers down, it's like, okay, well, you want me to take you seriously. So what's your plan to get there? How are you going to be moving out of your parents' house when you're 18? What's your job going to be? How much money are you going to be earning? How, how are you paying the bills? And then you structure that forward thinking of making them. Because one of the things that people don't understand with schools, and I would suggest that schools do really badly, is so here, here's a different example the things that dojos fight in schools and everything do excellent is they have a belt system so your progress is based on your achievements moving forward and as long as you consistently turn up you will continually be re rewarded with a rank that you wear around your waist that tells everybody around you what your skill set is in terms of what you've achieved and longevity and mastering techniques. You also get to balance that with sparring with people and practicing it. So, Cause sometimes you do get different belts and somebody can be a lower belt and be a very competent fighter mm -hmm. and, and can beat someone who technically is better than them just because of, like you said, that, that, that young lad who just you put him on the, on, on the mats and he's like a little devil. He's always going to be pe beating people that are better than him in terms of the belt. But there's a structure that makes you look forward. Yeah. And you realize what you have to do to achieve that. And there's a structure within there where you see people at all the different levels and what they're doing. So it's like a, br a blueprint that you can follow. Well, schools don't have that. So nobody at school understands what happens when you leave school. And yeah. I, I remember this. Uh, I don't know if schools still do it, but this thing, this illusion that schools, that when you leave school, if you don't have a good school report, people won't employ you. Yeah, yeah. If <laughs> your record of achievements is important. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know any employer that gives a, a single shit about your record of achievement or even what school you went to. They still spout off. If you exactly. have, I, I, I hear Anna cringe. If you don't get good GCSEs, you won't get a good job. Oh, that's, like, that's, like, that's like indoctrination. It is. And you know, I, if somebody wants one to, kid, sorry, go on. No, you know, I'll let you finish. I've talked I heard you a few one times. kid fire back at a teacher. I think it was the other week. I was in the room. I think it was it. I can't remember, but I was in the room. I don't know why there was two of them. And if you don't get good GCSEs, you won't get a good job. And this kid looked at him and went, "My dad left school when he was twelve. I went, and he's got a boss like um, building firm or whatever." I was like, <laughs> and all like the high achievers, all like I say, really sort of like wealthier people that I know. Build a terrible at school. This is it. This that's it, this illusion. And what you need to teach children is what's your plan based on when do you want to leave home? What sort of home do you want to have? What car do you want to be driving? You know, what, what do you want your relationships to be like? What's your friendships going to be like? All of those things. You know, like again, it's I said, if you want to be a competent fighter, a good fighter. You want to excel. How many times a week are you going to train? What's your diet like? What, mm. you know, what's the nutrition? What's your recovery? H how are you practicing your skill sets? How, how, you know, and this, this is what schools, you know, when, when somebody comes and sees somebody like you and they want to train and they come under that, that's what you teach them. But they see it with everybody else. Yeah. You know, like, like the kids that come to your, your classes also know you compete. So for them, they have a model of what they can follow when they want to achieve that. Schools don't teach that. And they don't even ask the question. It's all geared around, I've realised in the past few years, it's all for the benefit of the school, I think. Yeah. The results, that, that's what it's for. It's all for the teacher's benefit. That's what I've seen. And that, in my opinion, may be wrong. But looking around, it's all for them, I think. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, you, you'll get your GCSEs and you're going 
the levels and you go to university and then that then reflects on us because we'll be able to say how many the percentage of people went to university or how many people went to a levels exactly yeah nothing to do with personal success well and and that's another great question to ask children uh, teenagers what's your definition of success yeah because if you don't know what your family values are your friendship values are your business values you don't know any of those personal values that will work around work ethic and things like that how do you know what your definition of success will be because if you think that, like you know because the the common kind of like you know analogy is oh you know supercar on instagram you, you don't even know you don't even have a driving license you've never actually physically driven a car you know there's a reason you don't see supercars being driven every single day because they're typically shit day-to-day -day drivers yeah <laughs> it's not that people can't afford to run them every day you don't want to be stuck on the motorway in a supercar no <laughs> it's, not, it, it, it's they're not good commuters you know but then it's like the illusion again of social media isn't it? you can get people who fly to dubai or whatever and take a picture next to a parked supercar yeah like that's like that's a real thing as well isn't it it is it is it absolutely is and these are the things that you have to and so i think for people like you and i there's a great opportunity for us to do to go around schools and kind of have seminars where we teach kids hey this is actually what your mindset should be about and for, unless you get them to think past school and what they want because when you when somebody like if, if you want to become a champion you can get somebody to a place where they physically think about being a champion and then ask them how they deconstruct it to get there. What are the steps? If you deconstruct it, what will you have to do to get to that place? And if you do that with kids at school, I think school results might not get any better, but the success of, of kids will. Yeah. And they'll find where they want to go after school anyway, I think, as well schools the very heavy especially with this government the very heavy on everyone has to go to university so it's very academic like, I always go back to this also work what my dad told me years ago my dad said when he was younger you sort of had two pathways or you could do two pathways you could do like an academic pathway and like a creative or a vocational pathway and we've took that away yeah. like all like I, my, my brother and his friends they all didn't do very well in school they were quite naughty in that but they're now some of the most successful people that know they're all, they're all business they're all tradesmen Whereas like maybe if they'd, they'd have been pushed towards like the vocational path in say year 10, get them in, learn and like have, have a little samples of trades and then they'll find like the one that they want to specialise in. I think that'll really benefit kids as well. But I think everyone now, they've all got to do, really do this thing called the, the EBAC, the English Baccalaureate, where it's all geared towards kids doing very well academically. But yeah. some people aren't. Is that, I think the same as if you judge like the intelligence or like the ability of like, the ability of like the fish to climb a tree, you yeah. say it's dumb, yeah. like, no, like them kind of things, yeah. But like, exactly. not all kids are like that, are they? Some no, kids no, are really they're not. Creative. Some kids are really great with their hands and they'll, they'll excel and they're geniuses. There's a guy in my gym, he always refers to, refers to himself as like being thick and stupid. The guy makes furniture with his bare hands, yeah. he has that <laughs> skill. I went, No, you are so intelligent, yeah. And he, and yeah, he, he has some fixes in the gym, he fixed it for me. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? But it does, like they say, they, they judge themselves on their ability to memorise something from a book. Um, yeah, it, sad. It, it is, but it is. I, I find it fascinating that um, another thing that kids, schools are not able to teach children is how how much money you can make if you're just prepared to work 60 hours a week. Yeah. Just hard work. It's as simple yeah, as... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just work hard, you'll be amazed how, how successful you can be. Um, yep. Right, to finish, I've got two more questions to finish with, and these are completely random. If you could go to any place, any time in history, what would you be driving and what music would you be listening to? <laughs> okay, I, 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 always have, I always play this game with it off. I'd like to go back to the 90s in either like Liverpool or Manchester, probably drive like a four Capri. <laughs> yes. to like some like some like classic house and experience the rave era. I'd love to experience it first hand. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe like go like the Hacienda in Manchester, pull up in before Capri <laughs> or be Cortina. <laughs> no, I, I get that. I kind of you know I, I grew up around Cortinas and Capri, so I kind of might so, yeah, my 
Yeah, so I, t- I take you'd be listening to like the early house music. Yeah, I'd love to like experience, or maybe like go to like Chicago, for the same thing, experience them first warehouse parties, like the birth of a scene or like the disco scene in the seventies, the real disco scene in like New York, something like yeah. that. Yeah, that those um those early warehouse parties were fun. But, oh, uh, everywhere. They, they were strange. I, I'll give you one. One of the things that people can't. Um, uh, I, I won't get into it too much, but there's uh, for those that don't know, there's a, a young lady called Leah Betts who died from dehydration from taking ecstasy, mm-hmm. and that changed health and safety around nightclubs. So up until then, the water was always hot, so you couldn't drink the water out of taps. You had to buy the bottled water from uh, the bars, which was like, and you're talking like early nineties, and it's a pound a bottle. And the reason for that is people off their heads were not drinking alcohol. Mm-hmm. Okay. Also, there was never any fans or aircon, so by the time you got to like early hours of the morning, it might start to drip a little bit from all the condensation and sweat in the rooms. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd be like, "Oh, so it, it, it would feel like light rain." <laughs> it's, it's just where the rooms got so hot, it started to get to the top and just dripping back down. Yeah. So there you go. That's... The ceil- the ceiling was sweating. <laughs> it was, yeah, and, that, and that's what it used to be like. So. Using the same question again, but in terms of your industry, any time, any place, any when, where would you be and who would be training you? Okay, I'd like to go back to it's Wigan, because um, Wigan, there's a style of wrestling called catch, as catch can wrestling, and it was originated in Wigan. Um, oh, wow. I'd like to go back to like the 1800s and I'd maybe like to train with all them. Okay. Like, honestly, there's a a very brutal style of wrestling and it was and it derived from like the miners all just scrapping away and mm. it, it sort of died out now the style has died like, but there is like a revival going on of the style like the style that we teach in the gym we borrow bits of catches catch can but there was a big wrestling scene in Wigan and it spawned from there and it had a great influence on the current jiu-jitsu scene because the guy who sort of like, came from the channel the guy called Maeda he's travelled from Japan he's travelling around Europe he lands in Wigan for a bit Basically gets beat up by them, takes them technique, goes to Brazil and then, and shares it in Brazil. And it all stems. There's a lot of lineage, a lot of like famous fighters whose, whose lineage comes from Wigan. <laughs> it's oh, wild. Wow. It's wild. Yeah, I'd I like to go there. That. I didn't know. Yeah. That. I'll send you some stuff on YouTube about yeah. it. Uh, Please do. It's really I'd... fascinating. It's like all these guys beating each other up in Wigan. Yeah, catches catch cam wrestling. You, yeah, I, I'll definitely prompt you for that. I'll prompt you for yeah. that. Mate, th- this has been brilliant. Thank you very much for talking to me. I really Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks. I enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the David Watson Podcast. Please check out all of the links to Kevin and his club. I have included the link in the description about the origins of the fighting style from Wigan. And... As always, help me out, please. Like, subscribe, share. It makes a massive, massive difference. Thank you, as always. Have a great day and take care.